Welcome to Spot Check, the video update series for the greatest on reality, a dissertation about Dungeons and Dragons. I am Nick Miser. I wanted to start out today by giving you an update on my progress, what kind of data I've collected, how much of it, how I'm progressing through that, and so on and so forth. So, after the sites that I've been to, which include uh, some seasons at Gary Con in North Texas from before the Kickstarter, including New York, uh, Connecticut, Seattle, Denton, uh, what I have right now is about 35 interviews and 10 game sessions that I've recorded. And I'm going to get a few more of those in the months to come, a little bit to round out those numbers. But that's a, a the bulk of my data collection is now complete. I'm about 25% of the way through transcription, I would estimate. And that actually comes up to about 375 pages of text. So I'm going to have tons of data to work through, which is really exciting for what I'm going to be able to draw on for the final project uh, and hopefully that other people might have use of as uh, I'm going to be making all those transcripts public as I work through them. So uh, what's going on next week is that I'm heading up to Wisconsin for GaryCon, which is always uh, an exciting time and I learn a lot every time I go. Or this year, one of the things I'm particularly excited about is uh, getting to see the first level of Greyhawk Dungeon that Gygax made that has been recently kind of rediscovered in its entirety. Uh, Paul Stormberg's been going to be running that as part of a series of games being held at Gary's house. So I'll report back on that as I get to observe and see how that looks. Speaking of Gary Khan, Mark from Creative Mountain Games has just released a new module that uh, will be helping the Ernie Gygax Relief Fund. Now, uh, I don't normally talk about specific products, and it's not like a merchandise plugging sort of video series, uh, but I've, I've played with Ernie before. I've... Uh, written about things that I've, I've learned from playing with him uh, and as some of you know last year his house burned down and um, a, apart from all the personal losses that he had and the difficulty that's been for him there was also a lot of uh, really uh, interesting gaming material that was lost and so it's been a it's been a rough year in that area and so I wanted to mention the uh, this new module that has come out uh, for the Ernak and the, the proceeds will be going to the Ernie Gygax Relief Fund, and I'll put a link in the notes here. The name of the adventure is Fighting Fire. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek about the history of gaming and uh, about uh, the fire that destroyed Ernie's house. Uh, last bit of business before I start talking about the Quantum Ogre is that I'm uh, initially when I started the Kickstarter, if you go back and look at the rewards, I said I would be making a bi-weekly video series throughout my process. And uh, at some point in my enthusiasm, I decided to try and go ahead and take that and make it a weekly video series. And I've been able to do that roughly uh, with some some missed things here and there uh, since October or so. Uh, but as I'm getting towards where I really need to buckle down and do transcription, uh, I'm thinking that probably I'm going to need to slow the pace of my videos a little bit and actually switch to that fortnightly uh, release schedule. And so you'll see a little bit of a slowdown here uh, on the YouTube channel in the weeks to come. So this week I want to talk about something that's come up on a number of gaming blogs over the past few years. And to my knowledge, it started with Courtney Campbell's Hack and Slash blog. And someone in one of the interviews I was just transcribing from New York mentioned it. Uh, it's the Quantum Ogre. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar, the Quantum Ogre is sort of a an example of problems that come up in player agency when we're playing uh, a role-playing game. And specifically, the Quantum Ogre is sort of a, it's not quite a thought experiment, but I'll describe it that way. Uh, if you imagine a game session where the players are hunting down some sort of MacGuffin or another, and there are three possible woods in the area where this thing might be located, A, B, and C. Uh, basically, the Quantum Ogre is the ogre encounter that the Dungeon Master has designed that the players might encounter and decided that, no, they are going to encounter it. And it's quantum because the ogre is not placed in the game world until the players choose which forest they're going into, at which point the Dungeon Master says, okay, well, it turns out the, the ogre was in Forest B the entire time because I really want you to have this encounter. 
Now, it's a really interesting way of thinking through problems in player agency, and it's provoked lots and lots of blog posts. I'm just going to scratch the surface and kind of come at it from a, a different angle, some other thoughts that it's uh, provoked in me, uh, because people usually talk about uh, player agency, choice, players needing to have meaningful choices in the world, and the degree of subjective versus objective agency, how dungeon masters facilitate that and so forth, and those are all really important topics, and I'm still thinking through them. But one of the other things I've been thinking about is how we can use the Quantum Ogre as a way of thinking about the relationships between the Dungeon Master, the players, and the fictive world. And specifically, I'm going to be drawing on uh, some social theory by Michel Deserteau. And in Deserteau's work, he talks about the difference between strategies and tactics as a way of thinking about power relationships in the world. Now, Deserteau describes strategies as the techniques of the powerful. And by powerful, he means a very specific thing. He means people who are operating from what he calls a circumscribed proper, meaning a, a place that's bounded off in time and space that lets people act on other people. So uh, a classic example of this would be if you think of Mad Men, the TV series, where you have Don Draper and his friends up in a skyscraper, literally looking down on the city, uh, separated from them, um, as kind of an image of their separation overall by which they make all of these ad campaigns that act on all of the consumers as objects. And so there's a lot of power associated with that role of being in an ad agency. And there's lots of other places where people can uh, exercise that sort of power. And on the other side, Deserteau talks about tactics, which is the fact that, uh, which is what people do on the ground. Uh, consumers who are shopping, uh, to, to continue with the advertising metaphor, consumers who are shopping are making on the ground decisions tactically responding to the situations around them, their needs to get groceries and whatever other things that they might be needing to do uh, in response to the strategies of the powerful. Now, if we think about this in terms of uh, dungeon mastering and, and role-playing games, uh, a lot of times the dungeon master tends to be someone who's uh, exercising strategies on, on the players and on the game world. They're thinking long term, they have information that the players do not have, and they're bounded off sometimes uh, literally physically if, they, if they're using a DM screen. And so the dungeon master who places the quantum ogre is making a very strategic, in Deserteau's sense of the term, use of power. Now, a dungeon master who decides not to do that, um, so who might follow a strategy a little bit closer to what I've described as uh, coming from my conversations with Tavis Allison in New York, uh, might be a more of a tactical uh, dungeon master. So they're relinquishing some of that strategic power in order to sort of be on the ground with the players, so to speak, and experiencing things as they happen uh, by using random chance, for example. And so I think that there's some power dynamics that change based on whether or not the degree to which the Dungeon Master separates themselves and in a completely separate role with lots of extensive knowledge about the game world that the players do not have. So that's just a little bit, and I'm going to talk more about that next week and actually use it to lead in a way of thinking uh, about that in terms of uh, different religious roles, the spiritual roles that anthropologists have developed. And specifically, I want to talk about the idea as dungeon master as shaman next time. So uh, I'd like to hear from you about these strategies versus tactics, the quantum ogre and agency. If you have any thoughts in that area, please be sure to share them, and I'll look forward to talking to you all next time.